Hello, everyone. Welcome to How to Read Chinese Poetry podcast. I'm Zhong Qicai, the program host. In this podcast program, my colleagues and I aim to introduce cutting-edge scholarship on Chinese poetry to a broad general audience. We will present 52 episodes covering the major poetic genres developed over China's long history. Each episode features close reading of one or more of the best-known Chinese poems, with an aim to illuminate their literary greatness and cultural significance. For all the discussed poems, Chinese texts, English translation, romanization, and brief notes are provided at our website, howtoreadchinesepoetry.com. By following the 52 episodes, listeners will gain a bird's eye view of the thematic, formal, and generic evolution of Chinese poetry from antiquity to the modern era. Instruct and delight is what we wish to accomplish in each talk. Without further ado, let's begin. Today, we are getting started on topic 10, Quatrains, Unregulated and Regulated. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest host, Professor Charles Egan of San Francisco State University. Let us warmly welcome Professor Egan. Hello, everyone. This is the first of four podcasts on Tang Dynasty quatrains. In this first episode, we'll highlight the origins of the quatrain form in the pre-Tang period. The two jueju quatrain forms, the pentasyllabic jueju called wu jue and the heptasyllabic jueju called qi jue, are the shortest and most focused forms generally used by the Tang poets. Like the two regulated verse lu shi forms, which are exactly twice as long, both wu jue and qi jue are in the tonally regulated recent style poetry, jin ti shi category. Brevity is both constraining and potentially liberating. It forces writers to pare every topic down to a few essential images and then to harmoniously arrange them subordinate to a single a controlling theme. As the Qing critic Wang Kai Su writes, Jueju contain only four lines and not much space. So every line and every character must have meaning and flavor. Poems cannot bear even the least brushstroke of floating mist, that is words and phrases not to the point, or wasted ink. Brevity also encouraged the projection of meaning beyond the literal text by the reliance on symbolic poetic language and the development of artful structural techniques. Gao Buying, compiler of the early 20th century collection, Essential Poems of the Tang and Song, Tang Song Shi Ju Yao, explained, the number of characters in Jueju is not large. So if the meaning becomes exhausted, then the spirit will be withered. If the language is obvious, then the flavor will be short-lived. Only continual suggestiveness can make people lower their heads and imagine endlessly. This is the greater vehicle. Many traditional critics thus considered the two Jueju forms to be the most difficult. Tang poets reveled in the challenge to see big within small, xiao zhong jian da, and so used Jueju for the weightiest of topics, presentations of philosophical or religious states, expressions of fundamental emotions, reflections on history, descriptions of vast landscapes, and so on. As with other Tang poetry, the general tendency was to merge themes of the natural world with those of personal states of mind, often described as a fusion of feeling and scene, qing jing jiao rong. Yet when successful, Jueju could reach a level of intensity unparalleled by poems in longer forms. One might say that the best jueju are short bursts of flame as compared with the so slow smolder of longer poems. 
The term Jeju literally means cut off lines. And it was believed by many critics that this meant the Wujue and Qijue forms had originated as quatrain segments cut from the eight line Lu Shi forms. Adherents of this reductive view posited the truncation of Lu Shi yielded four structural possibilities for Jeju. First, where neither couplet is parallel, the structure constitutes the two outer couplets of Lu Shi. Second, where both couplets are parallel, it constitutes the two middle couplets of Lu Shi. Third, where the first couplet is non-parallel and the second parallel, it constitutes the first half of Lu Shi. And fourth, where the first couplet is parallel and the second non-parallel, it constitutes the second half of Lu Shi. A major implication is that Jeju aesthetics also derive from those of Lu Shi. However, it's now generally accepted the term Jeju dates to earlier than the advent of Lu Shi and was related to the Six Dynasties practice of multiple authors composing pentasyllabic linked verse, Lian Ju. When an individual quatrain segment was taken out of context of a Lian Ju, or if it never had other quatrains linked to it, then it was called cutoff lines, Jeju, or broken lines, Duan Ju. Moreover, the fixed length quatrain form long predated the fixed length octet. Although the truncated Lu Shi's theory is ahistorical, there is no doubt it influenced the interpretation and composition of Jueju during the Song and later dynasties. Yet for reading Tang poetry, we can start from the premise that Jueju development and aesthetics are independent of the Lu Shi forms. Pentasyllabic quatrains began earlier than heptasyllabic quatrains, and so will be our focus today. Six Dynasties Yuefu songs, Yuefu or Music Bureau songs, were a major source for Wu Jie, the pentasyllabic uh, quatrain. These anonymous songs fall into three subcategories. The Wu songs of the Jiangnan region, Jiangnan Wusheng, from the Southern Capital area, present day Nanjing, Western songs of Jing and Chu, Jing Chu Xisheng, from the area around the confluence of the Yangtze and Han rivers, present day Wuhan, and songs accompanied by drum, horn, and transverse flute, Gu Jiao Heng Chui from the north. These quatrains, predominantly love songs in a first person female voice, were cited as a source for Tang Wu Jue by literary historians as early as Gao Bing and Hu Yingling in the Ming Dynasty. Thematically, the songs are limited mainly to broken love affairs and the occasional happy reunion. Description of the settings and characters is also quite limited. The language is colloquial, direct, and highly emotionally charged. Analysis of linguistic elements suggests an oral performance milieu. The extant texts are characterized by strong and continuous syntax, a use of first and second person pronouns, and often puns. Most tellingly, a continual use of the linguistic categories of dyxis and modality gives the impression of direct speech. Dyxis, also called index, indexical expressions, is a term from the Greek for to point at something. It includes words and expressions that are ambiguous without specific knowledge of the context of the speech act. For example, hey you, bring that over here. That only makes sense when you know what the speech context is, who you are, what that is, and where here is. So modality is slightly different. Modality refers to subjectivity of expressions, as in inferences, conditionals, imperatives, questions, and so on. It's the grammaticalization of speakers' subjective attitudes and opinions. For example, if I say, he is an American, that is a simple declarative statement. But if I say, I think he is an American, that shows that I'm not entirely sure of of the truth of what I've just said. So therefore I'm hedging my best. I am certain he's an American. I, uh, that is showing my attitude towards that statement that he is an American and so on. Uh, so modality always implies subjectivity. And therefore, when you see it in a poem, it reflects back on some supposed speaker uh, behind the text. 
Another product of Six Dynasties Yifel music was the fixed length pentasyllabic quatrain form itself. It appears that popular Southern musical tunes and phrasing dictated the length. A singer standing in front of an audience creates a context full of dramatic potential. The language and phrasing used are designed for maximum emotional impact. The fixed length quatrain form of Six Dynasties music required the singer to say more by saying less, and so was the catalyst for the gradual invention of standard compositional formulas that relied on implicit suggestion. And once you have a compositional form formula, that means that parts of the poem are also have particular functions. For example, in a, in a quatrain, the first couplet would be some kind of an introduction. The second couplet would be the, where the resolution would appear. It can be reasonably argued that the experimentation with quatrains in the six dynasties led to interest in the fixed laying octet and eventually the development of the lusher forms. Let's discuss some of these uh, popular song examples. Uh, the following song is from the Jiangnan Wusheng, the Ziye song cycle. 42 love poems traditionally attributed to a, an, an Eastern Jin dynasty songstress named Ziye. Virtually all of these songs are from a woman's point of view. Seldom is a def definite order for any combination of these songs apparent. They're independent works on, on a similar theme. I am as the Northern Pole Star, a thousand years without wavering. My love moves with a white sun heart in the east at morning and at dusk returning west. Nong zuo bei zhen xing, qian nian wu zhuan yi, huan xing bai ri xin, zhao dong mu huan xi. What strikes one first upon reading this song is the active participation of the speaker in a human drama. It's her own story she's telling. The use of pronouns, simple active grammar, and similes all emphasize the spoken nature of the language. Uh, both couplets start with pronouns. First, nong, as a, you know, a self-referent uh, female voice. Uh, and then huan, an interesting, in the second couplet, huan is shi huan de huan you know, the word for joy, uh, but it's used as a pronoun in these songs, uh, even, you know, as a, my lover, essentially, even though it would not have been used that way in the colloquial language. The poem is structured as these two similes, and it's meant to show the constancy of the woman uh, singer's uh, love for her lover, uh, whereas it also criticizes the inconstancy, the fickle nature of her lover who is moving to the east at morning at dusk returning west, he's all over the place essentially, right? So this is a very good first example that for us to look at. One Six Dynasties technique to overcome fixed length was to employ clever homonym puns in the final couplet of the quatrains, which depending on which side of the pun one considered, cast the lines in wholly different ways. And essentially it extends the meaning of the poem without having to explain in a sense. Here's another one of the Ziye songs. Tonight I parted from my love. When can we be together again? The bright lamp shines on the empty chessboard. For a long time, there won't be any game. Jin xi yi huan bie, he hui zai he shi. Right, but uh, the, uh, you know, the last line, for a long time there won't be any game, can also be read as the oil burns on, but no date for our reunion has been set. Because yo is a uh, pun for yo, and ran means to burn, and then qi is also a word for a meeting or a date. So it's saying that she has no idea when her lover will return. The oil burning gives an intensity of emotion to the poem as well, that you know, her love for him and her missing him is like burning oil, right? It's a very effective way of showing her strong emotion without actually literally saying she's done that. But it's through the pun that this intensity of her emotion is seen. We can look at variety of other poems with puns. I'll mention a couple briefly because they're really quite uh, innovative and interesting. Here's another one of the Ziye songs. 
When I first met you, our two hearts gazed as one, threads placed on a neglected loom. Who could know no bolts would be made? Shi Yu Shi Lang Shi, Liang Xin Wang Ru Yi, Li Si Ru Chan Ji, He Wu Bu Cheng Pi. The pun is in the word pi, which is, can mean both of cloth, but also a mate or to marry, as in pi pei. Right. So the last line could be, who knows that we would not make a match, that we would never be together. So the cloth on the loom will not become a bolt of cloth, just as our relationship will not come to fruition. And when you look at it that way, then that in the, the beginning of the second couplet, the word li si, which literally means the arranged threads, because, you know, loom you'll have the vertical threads and you'll have the horizontal threads. So they're arranged in such a way that you then be, will make the cloth. But li si, if we're saying bu chang pei means not make a match, li si could be li si or the thoughts of parting, thoughts about separation as well. Here's another interesting pun from the du qu ge. One evening staying with you, all night we speak without cease. Cork trees on the 10,000 Li road. The way is bitter, truly without end. Yi xi jiu lang su, tong ye yu bu xi, huang bo wan li lu, dao ku zhen wu ji. Now to understand this, we should define what huang bo is. Huang bo is the name of a tree, the amber cork tree. That is a large deciduous tree with broad leaves and yellow flowers in the springtime. It's often used for Chinese medicine and the medicine is very bitter tasting. So Huang Bo essentially on the road is bitterness for a thousand li, essentially. So the way is bitter, the road, the entire road of trees is bitter without end. But the uh, pun comes in with the word Dao at the end because Dao can both mean a road, but it also means to speak right, which refers us back to the previous couplet, where they were speaking all night without end. But now we realize from that second couplet that what they were speaking of was about parting, was about was bitter, because their speech is now essentially uh, equivalent to the 10,000 li of bitter cork trees. Six Dynasty's literati Shi poets also adopted the pentasyllabic quatrain form and explored its potential. Yet stylistically, their written quatrain link Shi are almost the opposite of the Yuefu quatrain songs. Like longer contemporary Shi poetry, these quatrains are in a descriptive mode, aiming toward what the critic Zhong Rong in the sixth century called artful structure and descriptive similitude. Such poems create a vibrant verbal texture, often through parallelism, but maintain a somewhat neutral or distanced emotional stance. This effect is in part due to the fact that the writers tended to avoid the use of grammatical function words, which were considered empty words, in favor of content words, nouns, verbs, adjectives, and so on. The goal was to encompass objective reality without through written patterning. Declarative statements dominate and images are chosen primarily to appeal to the visual sense. In aggregate, to paint mental pictures with words. There's also often very much a de-emphasis de on the poet as, an, as a speaker, whereas the scene is allowed to, to present itself in a way. Uh, what language uh, lacks may lack in personal tone, it does make up for in philosophical cosmological resonance, for it developed in the context of nature poetry by poets such as Xie Ling Yun in the, uh, in the uh, early fifth century. Uh, the poem by, in praise of pear blossoms on the pond by Wang Rong uh, in the fifth century typifies the literary quatrain style. On ruined steps, they cover the fine grass. In pooled water, they scatter among the duckweed. Fragrant spring shines on flowing snow. Deep night reflects myriad stars. Fan jie mo xi cao, ji shui jian shu ping, fang chun zhao liu xue, shen xi ying fan xing. 
The transformation of the pear blossom petals floating in the wind to snow and stars is both striking and beautiful. The lines in each couplet are strictly parallel, but the language evokes an element of dynamism due to the use of strong verbs in the third position in every line. Such key words were termed ju yan, verse eyes, by later critics. But you will notice the great contrast with this poem and these songs we just mentioned, which were all about some kind of a personal perspective on a situation. Here, you don't even see the poet. You know, he, he's kept himself out of it to try to, uh, to make a, a poetic point through the visual factors alone. The same literati poets who wrote shirkwa trains were also a major audience for the Yuefu songs. Cross fertilization was both natural and inevitable. Yuefu quatrain songs by named authors incorporate descriptive language, including parallelism, more than do most of the anonymous songs. And as time went on, Shir quatrains increasingly exhibited elements derived from the subjective voice of the UFO singer. So in a sense, what we end up with is between the descriptive style and the popular song style, we have an intermediate style which combines some of the linguistic elements from the popular songs, Dykes' modality and so on, with the very innovative and elaborate descriptions that come out of the scholar poetry tradition. In particular, Yu Xin in the sixth century did much to transform the literati pentasyllabic quatrain into a medium for personal statement. His works can be considered precursors of many of the Tang Wu Jue. Yu Xin was a prolific pentasyllabic quatrain writer from the very end of the Six Dynasties period. And here is one uh, very good example, I think, that makes the points that I was just trying to, uh, to express. In his poem, Chongbie, Zhong Shang Shu Shi, parting again from Secretary Zhou, he writes, on the 10,000 Li road to Yang Pass, I've not seen a single man return, only the geese by the riverside at autumn southward fly. Yang Guan Wan Li Dao, Bu Jian Yi Ren Gui, Wei Yu He Bian Yan, Chiu Lai Nan Xiang Fei. Yang Pass in Gansu Province, southwest of Dunhuang, was the final boundary marker before the Chinese traveler entered Central Asia. Crossing the pass thus signified that civilization had been left behind. Presumably, Yu Xin's friend has been posted to an army unit somewhere on the border. Uh, uh, the focus of the poem is on the image of the flying geese in the second couplet. Migrating geese in Han Dynasty Yuefu Music Bureau poems were often described as carriers of news from border soldiers to their homes in China because of their migratory pattern, you know, south and north, depending on the season. In this poem, since I've not seen a single man return from beyond the Yang Pass, geese are the only tie between the border and home. In particular, Yu Xin and Secretary Zhou will have only this tenuous tie to maintain their friendship. If we go back and just look briefly at the grammar of that poem, you'll see it is essentially descriptive, but there are these modal expressions like, I've not seen a single man return. Bu jian yi ren gui is a modal expression. And wei yo, only geese by the riverside. That's also another, another modal expression. So you see that he, Yu Xin is putting his subjective spin on the scene around him. And this is, I would say, is an excellent example of a model that was followed in the Tang Dynasty Wu Jue, which uh, we'll be talking about in the next episode. Thank you very much. Let us thank Professor Egan for such a stimulating talk. We look forward to presenting his second episode on Quatrain next Tuesday. I hope you enjoyed today's talk. Let us relax and listen to a reading of the poems in English by Dr. Andrew Merritt and in Mandarin by Zhao Wenxuan. Jia Song I am as the northern pole star, 
a thousand years without wavering. My love moves with a white sun heart in the east at morning and dusk returning west. Tia Song Tonight I've parted from my love. When can we be together again? The bright lamp shines on the empty chessboard. For a long time, there won't be any game. Xie Song When I first met you, our two hearts gazed as one. Threads placed on a neglected loom, who could know no bolts would be made? Du Chi Song One evening staying with you, all night we speak without cease. Cork trees on the ten thousand li road, the way is bitter, truly without end. Zi Ye Ge Nong Zuo Bei Chen Xing Qian Yan Wu Zhuan Yi Huan Xing Bai Ri Xing Zhao Dong Mu Huan Xi Zi Ye Ge Jing Xi Yi Huan Bie He Hui 在何时明灯照空局悠然未有期子夜歌始遇石狼时两心望如一何物不成匹读曲歌一夕旧郎宋通夜雨不息黄檗万里路道苦真无极